This is Orford Ness, one of the most mysterious places in the modern history of the UK. Not only does it look like something from an apocalypse movie, it was used for testing nuclear bombs at the dawn of Britain's atomic weapons project. Despite its appearance, the Ness isn't an island or even technically a desert. Forming a pebble shingle spit, it is separated from the Suffolk mainland by the River Ald, except for a thin stretch of land running miles to Alderborough. This bleak corner of Suffolk is home to many dramatic sights, from 200 year old Martello gun towers to the medieval castle in Orford village overlooking the Ness and dominating the landscape. Yet as recently as the Cold War, what exactly went on at Orford Ness is still partly unknown. In this unique documentary, we visit the untrue island and take a look at the eerie structures left behind by the military across the secret desert. First, let's begin with the history. Whilst the Cold War has come to define the Ness's most mysterious era, its isolated location first captured the military's attention way back in the build-up to the First World War. The Royal Flying Corps, the precursor to the RAF, decided the Spit would be ideal for experimental aircraft testing. From 1915, everything from aircraft design to how to weaponise them was done here using captured planes as targets. This top secret bombing work continued into World War II, leaving the nest still heavily contaminated with unexploded ordnance today. Another revolutionary technology was also developed here. The first successful demonstrations of radar as an air defence system to detect enemy aircraft happened here in 1935, potentially saving Britain when war eventually broke out. After Britain worked with the United States to develop the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II, only a few years later it found itself having to develop its own atom bombs when America refused to cooperate. Orford Ness was one of the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment's key sites for this purpose. Believe it or not, nuclear bombs were tested here on British soil. However, nuclear components were left out, so the bombs could be tested more safely against environmental pressures such as extreme heat, cold, speed, shock and vibration. This way, flaws which might cause accidental nuclear detonations could be troubleshooted. Whilst no nuclear components were officially used at Orford Ness, the hardened designs of its buildings suggest that high explosives were definitely in use. Still, most of what went on at the atomic establishment at Orford Ness still remains a guarded secret, and the truth could one day surprise us. As technology advanced, the establishment closed in 1971, and its structures have sat derelicts ever since. At the other end of the Ness lies an over-the-horizon radar codenamed Cobra Mist. Facing east, it could detect hostile Soviet activity on the other side of the globe, but it was shut down in 1973 after only three years due to mysterious background noise. The BBC used it until 2011 and it is now privately owned. The rest of Orford Ness was purchased by the National Trust from the MOD in 1993, allegedly for the price of only a pound owing to its ordnance contamination. And that brings us up to today.
On a bright summer's day in 2021, we took a boat trip with the National Trust to the Ness after having visited Orford Village the previous year. After only a short trip across the river, we were excited to finally see the bizarre structures on the Orford horizon up close and personal. So we're at this place today, Orford Ness, somewhere that I've been interested in for a long while and I've never gotten the chance to come here but finally bit the bullet got the ferry over and we're gonna have a look around this island. It's been used throughout the years since World War One, right into the Cold War where Britain's first atomic bomb was actually developed here. And there's a lot of old buildings left from over the years. It's a really amazing area, quite a surreal environment actually, quite eerie. And we're gonna go and have a little wander around and see what interesting stuff we can find. We started the adventure by wandering around the inland part of the Ness. Almost a separate island in itself, the nature of this area comprises familiar marshy fields with retired military camps. The structures here vary in age, but have developed since the First World War along a road known simply as the Street. We began at the West End, looking at the ruins of the model bomb ballistics range. Built around 1955, this tunnel would have measured the stability of model bombs through the air with high-speed cameras. This next building from the 1950s briefly served as a headquarters and later became a telephone exchange. In recent years, it was the Visitor Information Centre, but this has been moved to a larger space. The new Information Centre is in this building, a refurbished canteen used in the Cold War by Atomic Weapons Research Establishment staff. However, the main part of this building dates back to the First World War as an officer's mess for the Royal Flying Corps. Amongst the displays, original relics can still be found. We next headed for the east end of the street. This World War I barracks would have housed troops working on Ness in its early days. This building is from World War II and it was used as an electrical workshop and photo office for processing high speed imagery from the bombing ranges. Whilst now isolated curiosities to tourists like ourselves, you have to remind yourself that these were once people's daily workplaces. Eventually the street crosses a large channel, separating this part of the Ness from the wasteland beyond, an other Ness. It was then that the views of the eerie structures that awaited us emerged from the horizon. This 
This Bailey Bridge suddenly transported us into another realm as we were greeted by the first of many imposing structures. The Bomb Ballistics building today provides commanding views for visitors, but back in the 1930s, these views would have monitored the fall of bombs dropped across the Shingle Ranges here in the days when aerial bombardment was new technology. The nest is still littered with craters from the bombs dropped during this part of its history. On the ground floor, these concrete bases would have mounted several cameras and a plotting table, looking out to the nest beyond. As the sun beat down on us, it began to feel more like we were stranded in a desert than close to the shore. Like the skeletons of perished creatures in the Wild West, various metal scraps stuck out of the shingle from its years of use. It is easy to see how the nest became so contaminated with unexploded ordnance, and it is difficult to account for the activities of this place which even at the time was guarded with secrecy. Allegedly, only the narrow pathways were made safe from ordnance when the MOD left. Despite a history of violence, perhaps the most iconic building on the Ness was its lighthouse. Older than any of the military activities on its shores, the lighthouse dates to 1792. Yet given how much the shingle moves over time, the shoreline here has receded several hundred metres. Despite its isolated location, the lighthouse was deemed a hazard, and in 2020 it was demolished before it collapsed. Visiting only a year too late, the lighthouse was now a pile of bricks. It is impossible to defend a nest from the tide, and one day a similar fate will befall all of its monolithic structures. The National Trust operates a policy of controlled ruination here, acting as caretakers yet allowing nature to take its course. This century old Coast Guard station now too lies under threat of either collapse or demolition, whichever claims it first. It was here we found ourselves at World's End, where both buildings and creatures have met their fates. Continuing inland, we reached yet another iconic location, perhaps safer from destruction for now. This small vibration testing lab was added during the Cold War when the site's headquarters moved to this area. When we visited, the Ness's structures housed an art exhibition named After Ness. As abstract as the installations were, it was hard to tell which was more surreal, the art or the landscape.
but this was the real attraction. The black beacon, or rotating wireless beacon, was an early radio navigation system introduced back in 1929. It could detect any ship or aircraft with a radio through a system which would evolve into radar. Luckily, it was open, so it was time to take a look inside. This is the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment site. Built in two main phases in the mid 1950s and early 60s, it's easy to see why this complex fascinates people. The first phase began for testing the Blue Danube, Britain's very first atomic bomb, and the facilities continued to be expanded as new designs were brought to the table. We began at the impact facility, constructed late during the second phase around 1963 or 64. High speed cameras were attached to the struts sticking out the top of the concrete wall which survives, and this would record impacts in the development of the WE-177 tactical nuke, which remained in service up to the 1990s. Next to the impact facility was a small mess room or store from phase one of the site, when the rest of our journey begins. Most of the buildings at Orford Ness were repurposed as technology changed fast and new facilities were needed and this area was likely adapted to serve the impact facility when it was built later. The mess room originally served this impressive remote control room, which in itself served the very dangerous Laboratory 1. Perhaps one of the most historically significant buildings at the Ness's atomic test site, Lab 1 was built here in 1956 for the Mark 1 Blue Danube bomb. This huge concrete building was buried in tons of shingle to contain an accidental explosion. This large open space in the lab is one of two halves. They are divided in the centre by a wall to ensure activities were kept confidential even from other workers in the same building. It may have been able to keep out espionage, but nothing has been able to keep out nature. The flooded pit on the right once housed the Blue Danube amongst other bombs in vibration tests. The tests done in this very room form the legacy of national defence in a nuclear age to this day. This is the entrance to the other chamber within Lab 1, used for drop testing.
If not already obvious from the ground, the massive size of this structure is clear from above, even when blended by sand into its surroundings. These plans show that you can only see the tip of the iceberg. As we wandered round the site, we next came to another concrete monster, Laboratory 3. It is easily identified by its giant shielded entrance and was built at a similar time to Lab 1 for climatic testing. In other words, seeing if bombs could still function in extreme temperatures, such as the climates of the parts of the world that they might be deployed in. The giant canopy leads to a barrel vaulted thermal chamber which could be set from 60 to minus 60 degrees centigrade. Amongst a Martian landscape like the Ness, this building may look like something from Star Wars, but comes from a time when Britain looked very much to planet Earth, whilst America and the Soviet Union looked to space. Next we came to the final building from the site's first phase. Laboratory 2 is in many respects a simpler variation of Lab 1's design. It only had one internal chamber which was used to test bombs against centrifugal forces. Its wide doors suggest the fully assembled Blue Danube could fit inside and its roof once would have been covered with thin cork and aluminium to direct an explosion upwards. tunnel leads to the main chamber inside. The circular brick structure here is a Napier centrifuge designed to spin bombs to simulate acceleration. This room was used for controls. This was an air conditioning plant room. As we continued through the atomic desert, time and place became disorientating as we were conscious of the sun and the last boat home. But we still had to see the second phase of the site's facilities. This imposing structure is a magazine known as the Armoury from around 1962, an improved store for the munitions used at Orford Ness. Consisting of a concrete tunnel, it has two ventilated bays off to the side. When talking to the caretaker, we were told that it has a strange smell which sticks to the sheep which shelter inside and its source has never been identified. Whilst the bombs tested at Orford Ness had their nuclear components left out, 
contradictory evidence has emerged surrounding the use of radioactive substances at the Ness. The official statement is that no radiological material was used here. However, many of the exact details about the establishment's secret activities are not yet released to the public. There are rumours from workers of overnight plutonium experiments here, but for now, we cannot know the truth. Regardless of the importance of the buildings we have looked at, it is the two pagodas built in the second phase which have become unique landmarks to the surrounding area. Their temple-like pillared roofs have fueled imaginations even whilst the top secret work went on here. Like Laboratory 1, these were both used for vibration testing. As bombs changed, so did the buildings. Whilst Phase 1 saw many bomb designs compete, codenamed everything from green bamboo to purple granite, Phase 2 was much more streamlined, with efforts focused on more successful leading projects. The iconic pillars held up huge slabs of concrete designed to entomb the buildings should a bomb explode by accident, breaking the pillars and sealing the blast. The fact that they remain intact suggests nothing went horribly wrong here, but other structures at the nest do show signs of lesser bomb damage. These photographs taken in the early 2000s show the tall interiors of the pagodas which go far down into the sand. These images of a model pagoda show what might happen should a bomb fail to withstand the vibrations it was tested against. Behind the pagodas is this centrifuge building. A modernisation of the centrifuge in Lab 2, it was again needed to keep up with more modern bomb designs. Like all the other facilities at this site, of course the Phase 2 buildings also needed a control room placed at a safe distance. Despite its more mundane appearance, it still cost £33,000 when it was built in 1960. As the UK further streamlined its nuclear weapons programme down to only the Royal Navy's Polaris missile system, there has been no need for the buildings here at Orford Ness since 1971. Orford Ness is the true meaning of a unique place. There may be nothing else like it, not only in the UK, but in the world. From wildlife to weapons that threaten life as we know it, the Ness is a place of contrasts. Yet in its decay, nature reclaims ruins even from the brink of mankind's evolution. Like the lighthouse, the Ness symbolises civilization's fragility. For us too, time was running out and we had to get back to the boat. As the tide ebbs and flows, the sun sets and rises on Orford Ness. Like the buildings upon it, the Ness itself is temporary. And as the sands of time are moved by the tide which made them, it may look very different a hundred years from now. We have explored what survives of the Ness incredible past. The waste of changing technology has become home for art and is by some considered art itself. Yet all we can do is observe its controlled ruination. 
like how those at this quiet Suffolk village have kept watch for centuries. The Ness's gates are open, but maybe now we can see what's inside. It raises more questions than it answers. But like every good story, as long as it keeps us wondering, it will stay alive.